Hello everyone and welcome today to today's webinar on the CUSMA USMCA TMEC Free Trade Agreement. Notice that we have three names in the title and that is because each country want to have their own name associated to the agreement. Any information you are getting from Canadian authorities will be named CUSMA and USMCA from US authorities and I've not seen anything to date as of yet from Mexico authorities, but assuming if I do, it would most likely read TMEC. So you're gonna see this slide a couple of times during the presentation, and that's because probably the most frequently asked question we've been asked by clients is, will there still be a NAFTA certificate required? Well, the answer is there will be a certificate of our origin required and simply called a certificate of origin and much more flexible than the current requirements for completion. One can still provide a blanket certificate, much like they do today, or others may choose to put the statement on the body of the invoice. Currently, a NAFTA certificate can only be completed by the exporter. Now it can be completed by the importer, exporter, or producer. There are risks involved, but provided one puts in checks and balances to pass a customs compliance verification by customs authorities, there are options. As the free trade agreement will take place on the first day of the third month after all three countries have given notice of readiness to comply with the new measures. Canada passed its version of the free trade agreement on March 13th, and both Mexico and Canada, Canada notified the US on April 2nd, 2020, that they've completed their ratification processes and meaning the US freight or they are not, they they are both in the process of updating their implementation regulations and what they will need to do to claim eligibility the US trade representative announced its readiness on April 24th 2020 meaning implementation of the new agreement is slated for July 1st 2020 my understanding is that there are going to possibly be some delays to the automotive and truck eligibility and the U.S. lawmakers have asked USTR to delay the USMCA regulations related to the automotive and truck eligibility to give lawmakers time to adjust to the COVID-19 crisis. Mexico's government have asked both Canada and the United States to grant its automotive industry more time to adapt to its supply chains for autos and trucks and urging authorities to postpone to January 2021. However, all indications are that the agreement will go through on July the 1st for all the other sectors and most likely some delays to this, to the automotive truck industry, which is a very complex and very important industry to us all. So there are two types of de minimis in the agreement. Part one is for the value of shipments that are allowed to be released from customs with, with little, if any, customs interference. Mexico's threshold will be $50 US tax-free and $117 level for tariff-free and simplified process. There's gonna be no change to the current $800 US threshold that has been approved by domestic law, and this applies to shipments worldwide. Canada thresholds are going from $20 to $150 Canadian for duties and $40 Canadian for taxes at the time or point of importation of goods shipped by courier from the US or Mexico. The goods do not have to be originating to receive the benefits. There are no changes to the existing de minimis threshold for postal shipments from the US or Mexico, as well as any courier or postal shipments from any other country. Let me give you an example of what this means for something coming into Canada. Let's assume that we've got a sweater coming by courier from the US and the country of origin is shown as China. Currently, under the, new, uh, under the current regulations, you would have to pay duties and GST on that full value. Under the new system, there won't be any duty on that sweater because there's a $150 Canadian threshold for duties, but you would have to pay GST on the value of the sweater. Customs Notice 20-18 provides information related to the implementation of the, the de minimis threshold. 
Uh, there are going to be some exceptions for which relief does not apply. Some examples include alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis products. And the amending order will be published in the Canada Gazette April 29th, 2020. And CBSA is working to update Customs Memorandum D8-2-16. Customs Notice 2014 provides information on the changes to the customs tariff with the implementation of CUSMA. All of the rules of origin, the specific rules of origin, are in Chapter 4. Your origin provisions are in Chapter 5. And your textile and apparel provisions are in Chapter 6. Under NAFTA, textiles and apparel didn't have its own chapter, but another very critical um, sector to all three countries with numerous jobs involved in, in, in that particular sec sector. For goods coming into Canada that were joint production between US and Mexico, they had a specific tariff code that would allow you to be used to cover the goods. Um, it was called the MUST tariff, Mexico, US. Um, they're doing away with that Mexico, US tariff code. And now the country of origin will be based upon how the rule of origin for the, uh, under the agreement reads. If you've got any advance rulings for origin that you had under NAFTA, they're no longer valid come July 1st, and you need to apply uh, for new application with customs authorities. Um, goods may be shipped from a customer country with or without transshipment. Um, paragraph 14 of the customs notice indicates that a refund can be filed within four years. A huge difference under current NAFTA agreement, refunds, post-entry refunds could only be filed within one year. This four years, four years allows for refunds to be filed much in line with many of customs. In fact, most uh, customs free trade agreements that we have, such as the Canada European Free Trade Agreement or the uh, uh, Trade Partnership uh, Free Trade Agreement for goods out of uh, South Asia. Customs Notice 20-15 provides information on regulatory changes for new value LVS thresholds with the implementation of KUSMA. CBSA's current levels are $2,500 Canadian. They're going up to $3,300 Canadian. Um, and in order to receive the benefits, the importer or owner of the goods must provide a written and signed statement from the importer, exporter, or producer of the goods certifying that the goods originate in a country that is a party to Canada's free trade agreements. Uh, currently, for shipments that are less than $2,500, um, in many cases, some of the suppliers have a what's called a low value statement, which is a generic statement just saying, hey, the goods qualify. We don't know whether there's gonna be any thresholds under, um, under the new KUSMA agreement. Understanding, our, uh, understanding is there may be some exceptions for shipments valued at less than $500 or $200, whatever they decide on. But currently there's been nothing in writing that I have seen that verifies uh, they are gonna have this. One of the things I, I Canada usually communicates their uh, changes by ways of customs notices. The US provides their notifications by positive or by posting their information on the Canada Border Protection website and updating their customs regulations. I really, really like this 64 page interim instructions that they published and very, very detailed with, with a lot of the things uh, that are gonna be happening with the agreement. There's 19 pages that are specific to the automotive industry and, uh, and uh, after I believe pages uh, 12 to 31, are strictly dealing with automotive and then after that you've got multiple pages as well as for for the textile part of it. Um, CBP is currently in the process of revising section 182 of their customs regulations uh, to provide uniform USMCA regulations. Uh, the harmonized code will, um, will be amended to include General Note 11 on the USMCA rules of origin and they're currently housed in General Note 12. So they're now going to have a specific general note uh, related to the USMCA rules. Um, except for certain agricultural goods, a good does not need to first qualify to be marked as a good of Canada or Mexico 
as was the case with NAFTA, in order to receive preferential treatment. So that's something that's real interest. That you may have been, you know, in Canada, if you had uh, a good meeting the rule of origin, the good be, would be marked under that rule of origin. In the U.S., even though the rule of origin for NAFTA may have indicated that it would be Canada or U.S., under Section 102.20, you still had to be, uh, or, or the U.S. had their own marking rules outside of NAFTA. So you could have something that would qualify for NAFTA and would, st would have to be marked Mexico, and now it might have to be marked USA. So a big change in the U.S., and that's probably a positive thing from many of the people that I have talked to. Um, one of the comments that I actually had heard from a couple of presentations in the U.S. was, remember, distinguish the country of origin from the rule of origin as they are not the same. So we're going to get into de minimis, and I call it de minimis part two in this part. The per de minimis part two in the agreement is the percentage of non-qualifying content that can be disregarded in tariff shift or regional value content analysis, and it's being increased from 7% to 10% based on the value of the article. So for everything under the agreement, the de minimis is based on value other than textiles and apparel. The 7 to 10% uh, or the 7% currently to now 10% is going to be based on weight and not value. So I put a little example here as to what's going to happen. Surplus Inc. imports a product into Canada from the United States, which is subject to a tariff shift rule of origin. Upon review of the bill of materials, the total cost of the materials going into the product is $1,000. So we asked the client, hey, I need your bill of materials. Of course, the bill of materials has to have description, value, and origin. I go through it and I look at all of the, the products that are of Canada, US, or Mexico origin. And I don't even need to be concerned about those because they're going to qualify. And that's $400. Now I'm going through the bill of material and I'm looking at all of the other goods um, that are class or that are in the bill of materials and I notice that $525 of those products, they're going to meet the tariff shift. Things like nuts and bolts and screws, no matter what the origin is, I'm, I'm going to meet the tariff shift, which leaves me with $75 as non-originating and non-shifting. So under NAFTA, the product would not qualify since $75 is 7.5% the value um, of the products. Under the Kusma agreement, it will qualify for the benefits as the de minimis is now 10%. I'm gonna give you an example of uh, a change to one of the rules of origin that uh, actually got a call from a particular customer who said, hey, we got a call from somebody in China and we're currently buying our graders and our levelers from them and there's no problem in Canada because the goods coming into Canada are duty-free regardless of origin we don't have any of these 301 duties like they do in the United States so we're you know the problem that we're having though is that we love the Canadian market but quite frankly the majority of our product is being sent into the US and the US now have section 301 duties on products from China and our products are going to attract a 25% 301 surtax duty. And quite frankly, it's just not going to make us competitive. So we thought we'd give you a call to see if you got any thoughts on maybe how we could talk together and see if we can do something. So um, I had no idea when they first called. This is when the, you know, the agreement kind of first was starting. So I looked at the... The, the, the tariff, these are the tariffs for the product. You don't have to spend a lot of time with that, but um, in case you ever start looking at the, the tariff after, you will get copies of these presentation. It may make more sense when you call the tariff up, but though, those are the tariffs that are currently in place for the machines. And the current NAFTA rule of origin says, a change to those machines from he any heading outside that group, except from heading 8431. So heading 8040, 8431 is a provision for parts for those machines that are not naming things like nuts or bolts or screws. It would be just something that it's classified as a general part of that machine. 
Uh, and when you're looking at a bulldozer, I'm sure there's hundreds of parts on that bill of materials, and it's pretty certain that you're going to have some of the articles on there that are going to be classified under tariff 8431, and most likely they're going to be not, you know, U.S., Mexico, or Canada origin. So um, the current rule then says a change to 8428, or, or to the machine, from heading 8431, whether or not there's also a change from any heading outside that group, and you've got to meet the regional value content of either 60% when you're using the transaction value method or 50% when you're using the net cost method. So it doesn't mean that your product isn't going to qualify. It just means there's going to be a lot of administration uh, involved to make sure that you've got all your record-keeping uh, stuff and all your calculations so you'd be able to withstand a current audit with customs. So I now look at the, the current or the rule of origin now under the new USMCA and it reads, a change to the machine from any other subheading, period. So I'm thinking to myself, well, that's a real interesting rule because those particular tariffs they're talking about 8428.10 through 8430.69 are complete machines. So it's telling me if I'm making a machine, as long as I'm not importing a machine, I'm going to meet the rule of origin, notwithstanding where any of the parts come from. So that's a, that's a really big change in the agreement. And as you're going through, you know, you've got to remember that when you're, when you're certifying your rule of origin or your, your ability, eligibility under the new agreement, Everything is based on the tariff classification of the product. So what you've got to make sure that you're doing is make sure that you're looking at the current rule and look at the rule of origin of the USMCA. And there could be some changes. I'm noticing lots of them in the machinery area, some of them in Chapter 90, which is your optical instrument. So you've got to be very familiar you know, with the products that you're currently sending into those countries and making sure that you cross-reference it to the, uh, to the new rules. I, you know, my 80% of the products aren't going to change, but there are some significant changes. That's just an example of something with machines. So another example in, in, in the new agreement is the USMCA provides clarity on the product, specific rules for the treatment of sets for retail sale. So, um, in certain areas of the, of the tariff, sets are, are specifically named. So, there's a specific tariff item for first aid kits, uh, a specific tariff classification for kitchenware sets, for instance. So, the definition of a set says, consists of at least two different articles, which are classified in different headings, and consist of products or articles put up together to meet a particular need or carry out a specific activity and put up in a matter suitable for sale directly to users without repacking. So the real, the good example they give in that customs bulletin is a spaghetti meal. So you're buying a spaghetti meal at the store, it comes with spaghetti, comes with some grated cheese, comes with tomato sauce, it comes in one carton. I think Chef Boyardee is the name I used to remember but used to buy those things. And customs would allow you, because it, it performs a specific, it creates a spaghetti meal, they're gonna allow you to use one tariff for that. And the tariff that they decided to use is pasta under, tariff, it's under tariff 1902 for the spaghetti. So the new rule, the, the, the definition of the rule in the USMCA says, a set is originating only if each good in the set is originating. And both the set and the goods meet all other applicable requirements or the total value of the non-originating goods in the set does not exceed 10% the value of the set and the goods meet all other applicable requirements. So for the next few slides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide you with some of the highlights based on the various sectors. Um, the automotive sector is still very complex and still undecided for many points. However, these particular points that I put in here should not change. Currently, the regional value for motor vehicles to qualify is 62.5% regional value content. Well, that's going up to 75% uh, 
um, but it's not going up immediate. It's going to be phased in over a, uh, an increase of, well, 3.5% the first year. So come July 1st, your qualifications are now going to have to be 66%. Come 2021, they'll be 69%. 2022, 72% until we hit that 75% threshold in 2023. Uh, you must also now, under the new agreement, certify that at least 70% of the steel and aluminum purchases originate in North America for duty-free treatment. This is a real interesting one. You'll notice that I highlight the term or the, uh, the, the word average in this. So labor value content requires workers to earn an average at at least $16 US per hour, which equates to 2091 currently Canada, 30431 in the US. So the, the average, I, I never heard average at all when I first heard this thing, when it, you know the agreement came out and you hear things. Average, uh, currently it says that all workers that are directly involved in the manufacture of an automobile. So what does this really mean? Well, for sure it means your people on you know the assembly line, but I'm thinking it's gonna for sure also include all your research and developmental people and really don't know why it wouldn't include some of your high paying jobs such as your CFO because they need to cost the goods which means they could be buying things all over. So it, when I read the term average, I, I'm assuming what they'll do to qualify a factory is they will take all of their employees that directly involved, divide it by the total salaries and come up with an average of $16. So when I read this, it, and you know, I'm, I'm saying to myself, it may not mean that every single employee in that factory needs to be making $16 an hour. So section 232 tariffs. So the U.S. has imposed 232 duties on shipments of steel and aluminum. So read this first bullet point here. Two side letters provide Mexico and Canada with relief in the event the U.S. imposed punitive tariffs on imports of automobiles and automobile parts. That's an example of a 232 tariff. So you're probably saying to yourself, so what is a side letter? So a side letter is an agreement between two or more parties dealing with a particular sector or products. And currently the U.S. has agreed to essentially exempt Canada and Mexico from potential Section 232 increases on autos and auto parts. However, this clause allows them the ability to impose duties either with one or both countries. And these are just some of the exclusions that they currently have with regards to automotive. And one of the interesting things here is you see that they're mostly the same for, you know, the number of vehicles that can be allowed in, uh, exclusions on light trucks. Um, but this, la this point here I found really interesting. Exclusion from Section 232 duties for the first $32 billion worth of auto parts from Canada and the first $108 billion worth of auto parts from Mexico. So it kind of really shows you where most of the automotive uh, part manufacturers are uh, currently in, in the agreement. The dairy industries have been a significant talking point in the negotiations. Canada wants to protect its current tariff rate quotas and the US wants more market share. So I guess a bit of a give and take approach with some of the things that are gonna be happening. Again, trying to put all these things, just some of the highlights and really trying to put it on one slide if I can. So Canada had largely exempted dairy market access for general free trade obligations, um, which will allow US dairy more access to the Canadian dairy market similar in size to those with the Canada-European agreement, agreement or the Ca Customs Trade Partnership Agreement with South Asia. Um, the Canadian government has agreed to provide new tariff rate quotas, which will provide increased duty-free access for U.S. milk, cream, cheese, and a host of other dairy products, equivalent to approximately 3.6% of its Canada's current annual market. Canada has agreed to eliminate classes six and seven protein substances from the milk pricing structure and to limit exports of milk protein concentrates, skim milk powder, and infant formula. Uh, infant formula, you know, in the U.S., 
I've been led to believe that you know most of the infant uh, formula is actually manufactured in Canada. And the U.S. has agreed to provide limit access to Canada exports of dairy products, peanuts and peanut products, and sugar and sugar containing products. Some other agricultural provisions, Canada's agreed to treat wheat imports the same as domestic wheat for grading and pricing. Um, Canada's gonna provide some new tariff rate quotas for US chicken, eggs, and egg products. In other words, more increases, much like they do for, for the dairy industry. Um, and you, the USMCA is the first trade agreement for the U.S. that addresses cooperation, information sharing, and other trade-related rules um, related to biotechnology and gene editing. So textiles and apparels have some good things, but some also some more restrictive requirements. Um, along with the automotive uh, sector, this sector is vital to all three countries with numerous jobs at stake. And a separate chapter has been created, Chapter 6, for this sector. Um, adjustments were made to the tariff preference levels, commonly referred to as TPL if you're in that trade or industry, such as more than doubling the amount of U.S. cotton and man-made fiber apparel exports into Canada. Currently, for usually for products coming into Canada from U.S. manufacturers where they're using non-NAFTA fabric, those restrictions and you know are, are usually up by April or May, there isn't any TPL left. It doesn't mean that they can't send the goods to Canada, but they're subject to duty. So there will be some increases there to allow more of this. Um, really big for Canadian, ex so if you're a Canadian exporter and a manufacturer selling goods into the US, even though you're probably gonna have the product be duty free under with the TPL, the tariff preference levels, um, you have to pay what's called a merchandise processing fee, commonly referred to a, as a customs user fee with a minimum of $26 per entry and a maximum of $500. Um, that's going away. So as long as you can get TPL, uh, your goods are gonna be duty free and you're not gonna pay that merchandise processing fee. So that's a good thing, especially if you're you know, sending four or five shipments a week into the US Things like suits, which are, you know, there's a company in Montreal that does a lot of suits. So, you know, if you're paying a merchandise processing fee of, you know, up to $500 an entry, that's, that's a good thing. Um, the USMCA is going to eliminate the NAFTA demand that visible linings must be sourced from member, member countries. So what, vis what visible linings are a good example? You take a men's sports coat. He takes his coat off and you look at the lighting that's visible to the back. That has to be NAFTA fabric. They're doing away with that. But there's going to be some more restrictive uh, requirements that are going to be um, for things like narrow elastic fabric, sewing thread, and pocket bag fabric. And those are going to be phased in over a 12 and an 18 month, uh, um, I guess, the goods have to be formed and finished in a NAFTA country, but they're not doing that immediately. It's going to be phased in over a 12 to 18 month period. You know, another good thing, um, the original talks were that they were going to assess duties on things such as ebooks and products you could download, um, but they decided to leave that as it is. So things like ebooks, videos, software games that you're downloading. Uh, when you even though you're buying it from say an American or Mexican supplier or or uh, person, you're not going to have to pay any any duties on those things. So that that's a good thing. One of the things Canada did not have in NAFTA was dealing with counterfeit goods. Our only restriction was for goods made from prison labor. So under the new agreement, there's a clause for products made from forced labor, and forced labor includes things like. Uh, child labor. So if hap something happened to come into Canada that there was a, you know, the U.S. had a complaint against a company in Asia, for instance, where there there was reason to believe that the goods are being made with child labor. If those goods did get into Canada, there'd be nothing that would not allow us to not clear the goods. So this new agreement, this child labor, uh, has this child labor clause. So again, that that's probably you know, uh, another good thing. Um, 
the other interesting example that, I, that I'll give you with having to do with counterfeit goods is um, a period of time ago, and I, I can't remember how long ago, I'm thinking about six or seven years ago when the, the Juno Awards were in Canada, we had a particular client that wanted to have some garments sent from China into Canada to get to the magician, mu musicians on TV. And, and we were tracking the shipment and the goods. When you have goods go from China to Canada by air, apparently the planes stop in Alaska to refuel. So the goods got shipped and we ended up finding out that, hey, why aren't these goods getting out of Alaska? They're holding in there. So figured it would be just simple call to US Customs saying, hey, you know, you guys, this is this labor address wrong? Because these goods are coming up into Canada. And remember the customs officer saying, hey, you know, we have the ability to stop anything that lands in our, in our land uh, for examination. In this particular case, it was found that uh, the zippers used to manufacture the particular garments were a knockoff from a YKK zipper. So we don't see a lot of that in Canada, but I'm wondering now this provision is going to allow <clears throat> either one of the countries to go into each other's countries and, and, uh, and look at things. Just a couple of other highlights here. Um, the USMCA includes an unusual new provision related to free trade agreements with non-market economies such as China. So if Canada, for instance, start free trade negotiations with China, both the US and Mexico must, you know, uh, must pr or Canada has to provide the US and Mexico with the opportunity to review the full text of the agreement 30 years or 30 days, I wish it could be 30 years, right? 30 days prior to be signed. Entry into such a free trade agreement allows one or both or other or one or one or both of the other countries to then terminate USMCA on a six month notice. Um, just another thing, there's a sunset clause uh, which provides for an automatic termination after a fixed period unless the agreement is explicitly extended by the parties. Um, USMCA extends the period to a 16 year term with a review every six years. So after six years, the three countries sit down and say, hey, this is a pretty good thing. So they'll review it for another 16 years. There's a provision uh, for remanufactured goods that allows them, those goods, the same treatment as new products. Things like parts that are removed from automobiles, currently referred to in many cases, you'll probably see that term core, core uh, uh, deposit on a lot of the year invoices coming in, um, that are set for, re, uh, for refurbishment. Products in the assembled in the territory are a, entirely or partially composed of recovered goods, and they have similar life expectancies and meet similar performance standards as new goods, um, and enjoy the same similar factory warranties as new goods. And these provisions were necessary to endure, ensure that remanufactured goods receive same, the same treatment as new products. And now we're, as earlier indicated, you're gonna see this slide come up a couple of times. So the agreement is a lot more flexible and a lot less rigid than the current NAFTA. Um, last week, the client was really, really concerned. They're, they're, a, they're a large importer and exporter and they were concerned about how they're going to manage their NAFTA certificates under the new agreement and basically said, you know, what do you guys think? And you know what, one of the, our reply was, well, what do you want to do? And they said, well, what do you mean, what do you want to do? I said, well, I said, sit down with your team, look what you're currently doing, what would you really want to do? And what, when you figure out what you really want to do, let's sit down and talk again and let's see if we can put together a process that will have you pass an audit, customs audit. You know, it indicates here that the NAFTA certificate can be completed by the importer. I'm saying to myself, are you kidding me? If I'm importing something into Canada and I'm the importer of record and I'm gonna certify the NAFTA certificate, most likely I'm gonna get some type of a customs request saying, do you guys really know what you're doing? But you know what, instead of maybe having to manage 100 certificates, maybe you'll want to do a consolidated invoice to uh, send to your service provider. So there's so many options available, the key being that whatever option you decide, 
just make sure that you sit down and put proper processes in place to administer the agreement. And finally, just get to a couple of things here. Um, Canada, CBSA has posted uh, a comprehensive page for importers to refer to regarding the new trade agreements. There's your link right there. And the U.S. actually have two of them. They have one that will talk to you about the new free trade agreement, but they also have opened up what's called the U.S. MCA Center. So it, it's a dedicated team strictly available to answer, or answer any questions or address issues uh, dealing with the agreement. In summary, what are some of the things I need to do now to be prepared? Well, you want to compare your rules of origin and specific rules of origin to determine what has changed. If that's the case, determine if any sources should be pursued. Update your annual solicitation processes, evaluate your record keeping practices and ensure adequate records are maintained. Ensure your key stockholders, both internally and externally, are properly informed and update your compliance procedures. And you can expect strict enforcement by CBSA, CBP and Mexico authorities. Thanks. In the time remaining, Bob and a few of GHY's consulting team members will be available to answer questions that come forward. Questions that can't be responded in the next 15 minutes will be addressed after the presentation and the webinar concludes. Thank you for your time and stay safe.